When you take a photo, the camera's focus is locked the instant you press the shutter. But that changes with generative AI. With a single image, we can add more defocus blur, bring everything into sharp focus, or even refocus on a different subject. The ability to refocus after capture empowers everyone to make creative, artistic choices in photography. In this video, we will first learn how camera focusing works, explore how this knowledge enables us to train AI models for refocusing, and showcase example applications. Let's start with a simple thing. Imagine a tree in front of you. How do we capture its image using a camera? Let's place a sensor in front of the scene. The sensor records light rays coming from the scene. But each pixel receives a mixture of light coming from different parts, rather than just one precise position. As a result, the image captured by the sensor appears extremely blurry without any details. One simple trick to fix this is by placing a barrier with a small hole in front of the sensor. The barrier blocks most of the light rays, allowing only those passing through the center to reach the sensor. This setup is known as a pinhole, or more generally, an aperture. With this setup, each pixel on the sensor collects light from exactly one specific point in the scene. Therefore, we can capture a sharp image. But why is this image so dark? Well, since the barrier blocks most of the light rays and only lets a tiny fraction through, much less light reaches the sensor. This means that we have very low signal-to-noise ratio. Because the sensor receives so little light, achieving a properly exposed image would require an extremely long exposure time. How about increasing the size of the hole and let more light through. In this case, we did improve the signal-to-noise ratio. However, now each pixel gathers light from a broader area, including neighboring points. This leads to a brighter but blurrier image. Is there a way to achieve both a sharp and bright image at the same time? To do so, we replace the barrier with a lens. The lens bends incoming light rays and focus them on the sensor. This means that the incoming light rays coming from a particular point in the scene converge to a corresponding point on the sensor. This ability to focus light enables us to use a larger aperture, capturing more light for a higher signal-to-noise ratio while maintaining a sharp focus. But how do lenses actually form an image? Let's explore this with a simplified model. Here we assume the lenses is extremely thin compared to its diameter. This allows us to simplify our analysis and ignore the complexities introduced by thick, multi-element lenses. There are two key properties. First, any light rays that pass through the center of a thin lens continues in a straight line. Second, parallel rays converge to a single point located at the focal plane. We call the distance between the lens center and the focal plane as focal lens. Using these two properties, let's trace how light from a single point source in the scene travels through the lens. Let's consider one of the light rays coming from our point source. We first trace its parallel ray that pass through the lens center. According to the second property, we know that these two parallel rays must converge to a point on the focal plane. Therefore, we can determine how this lens would bend this ray so that it pass through this yellow dot. Let's try another one. For this ray, we first find the parallel rays that pass through the lens center as the dotted line. Find the intersection at the focal plane. And then connect the refracted ray with this point. Repeating this process for all rays from a single point shows that the lens brings them together, focusing the rays onto a unique point on the other side. When we place the sensor at this position, we get a sharp image. Now, it's useful to describe the relationship between the object and the resulting image on the sensor. Here, we have the object height in the scene 
and its image height on the sensor plan. To find the relationship between the sync space and image space quantities, we use the concept of similar triangles we learned in high school. This means that the ratio of the image height and the object height is equal to the ratio of the sensor distance to the object distance. We refer the ratio of the image height to the object height as magnification m. Now there's another pair of similar triangles. The magnification m can also be expressed as the ratio of the sensor distance minus the focal length to the focal length f. We can now derive the formula that relates the in-focus object distance, the sensor distance, and the focal length of the lenses. This is known as Gaussian lens formula. It tells us how changing the sensor distance affects the position of the focus plan. From this, we also know how to compute the magnification using the object distance. This is great! All the points on this focus plan appear perfectly sharp on the sensor. But there's no free lunch. Imagine there's a dog behind a tree. The light rays coming from the dog converge to a point before reaching the sensor. As a result, we get a blurry image of the dog. This is called the focus blur. When an object is not perfectly in focus, the refracted light rays spread out into a small disk on the sensor rather than a single point. We call this disk the circle of confusion. The size of the circle of confusion determines how blurry a point appears on the image. To figure that out, we again use the concept of similar triangles. Here we have the height of the object on the focus plan and the radius of the aperture, that is, half the width of the opening. This size of the smaller triangle represents the difference between the actual object distance and the distance at which the object is perfectly in focus. The corresponding side of the larger triangle is the actual object distance. Based on the geometry of similar triangles, we can establish a proportional relationship between the corresponding sides. But what we really care about is the circle of confusion C. To establish this relationship, we again apply the proportionalities between the object height and image height that we discussed earlier. In this case, the image height represents half the diameter of the circle of confusion. Combining these two equations gives us this simple expression. Moving the point back and forth, we can see the range where the circle of confusion remains sufficiently small. This leads to the concept of depth of field. It's the range of object distance over which the image appears sufficiently sharp. We can expand the depth of field by decreasing the size of the aperture. This reduces the amount of light reaching the sensor, but increases the range of distance that appears sharp. Now we understand how focusing works. We are ready to apply this knowledge to train our refocusing model. Starting with a sharp or in focus image, we first estimate its dense depth map. This depth map tells us the distance of the scene for every pixel in the image. With the equation, we can compute a defocus map. The defocus map specifies how blurry a point should be in the image. Here we change the sensor distance so that the focus plan is close to the camera. The purple color represents less blur, while the orange color represents more blur. With the defocus map, we can synthesize this image by applying spatially varying blur to the input or in focus image. We can move the focus plan to the middle and synthesize a refocus image. Here is another defocus map example where we focus on the trees in the back. By increasing the aperture size, we can increase the amount of defocus blur. With this simulated data, we can train our refocusing model. We use a set of three images, an all-in-focus image, a refocus image, and its corresponding defocus map as a training triplet. We use the training data to train two models. The first model takes an image with single-size defocus blur as input 
and predicts the corresponding all-in-focus image. The second model takes the all-in-focus image and the target defocus map as input to generate the image with the desired defocus blur. We train our model by fine-tuning a pre-trained text-to-image model, leveraging its strong generated prior. Now the problem of the second model is that all the target refocus images are synthetic. As a result, the model struggles to generate the natural appearance of real images with defocus blur. To mitigate this problem, we use a dataset of real images with defocus blur. We use our trend deburr net to estimate the all-in-focus image. We then use the estimated all-in-focus image as input to train the bouquet net to synthesize realistic defocus blur. But for this, we need to get the corresponding defocus map. Fortunately, using the all-in-focus image, we can predict its depth map and infer the focusing parameters, such as aperture size and focus plan positions, that will reproduce the defocus characteristics observed in the input image. This enables us to train BokehNet to create images with realistic defocus blur. Let's see some refocusing examples. Here is the photograph capturing the moment when the astronaut Aldrin Aldrin shakes hands with a young boy. With our model, we can increase the defocus blur to further highlight the subjects, or bring everyone in the scene in focus. This capability effectively allows us to change the aperture size after the photo was taken. In addition to changing aperture, we also support changing the focus plan. These flexible controls allows you to set the right focus for your visual story to guide the viewer's attention. Now, let's explore some practical scenarios. In group photography, it's challenging to ensure that everyone is perfectly in focus. Our model creates clear and sharp images. Thanks to the generated priors, it recovers rich appearance details even for images with strong defocus blur. Shadow depth of field is especially common when photographing small subjects. Capturing all the fine-grained details often requires taking multiple photos at different focus distance and merging them together. Our model can generate a sharp image from a single input. The all-in-focus image provides creative freedom that previously had to be planned in advance at the time of capture. In this example, I found it interesting that we can even recover the numbers that were mostly unrecognizable in the input image. We can finally see where Mr. Bing is and the people in the back. In addition to changing size, we can also change aperture shape. This creates interesting bouquet effects. Instead of bringing everything in focus, we can change the focus plan and shift the focus onto a different subject like shifting the focus from the model to the photographer, from the photographer to the model, or from the audience to the stage. Our editing produces realistic defocus blur while faithfully preserving the original image content. Here is a comparison with Nano Banana Pro from Google. While the state-of-the-art editing tool can indeed shift the focus to the subject and achieve semantic correctness, the results often lack visual fidelity. Here, we refocus this historical photo to the cameraman in the back while keeping the contents unchanged. In contrast, Nano Banana Pros alters the expression and the poses. Refocusing allows us to reinterpret the scene by increasing or decreasing the defocus blur, or use it as a restoration tool to bring greater clarity to moments from the past. We have released both the code and model on our GitHub page, along with an easy-to-use demo on Hugging Face for everyone to try. Feel free to check them out in the video description. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.